Good evening, July 18th. Where is the month going? Well, praise the Lord. Here we are, and we are jumping into a word of encouragement. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about David tonight, so it's going to be good. Uh, David is probably, um, out of all the Old Testament individuals, he has a way of transitioning um, uh, between the two covenants. In other words, um, he has a heart um, that transcends both the new and old covenant. And uh, because of that, I mean, God, when God referred to David, hey, Ronnie, how you doing? Uh, we're waiting for the rest of the family to come on. So it's just me and you right now, unless others are watching and they haven't said hi. And I want everybody to at least say hi if you're watching so we can all know that uh, the family's growing and the family's connected and we're all going to be on the same page. Hey, Miriam, how you doing? God bless you. And uh, so we're going to talk about David tonight. Um, and uh, as I was saying before, uh, out of all the Old Testament uh, individuals, um, David to me is the one that transcends the, uh, the covenants, the new and the old covenant. He uh, transcends both. Sandy from Stowe, Vermont. God bless you. That is so cool. Um, technology, right? It helps us connect no matter where we are. It's a pretty cool thing. So we'll wait for a couple more people to pop on and then we're going to jump in. Um, if you wanted a title for tonight, uh, we're going to really uh, tackle uh, Psalm 34. But um, Psalm 34 is, is really... Uh, kind of a testimonial of David's experience uh, from uh, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 21. And so we're going to kind of dovetail the two together. We'll put them together and uh, we'll see where God's going to take us. So if you want the title for tonight, it would be Taste and See That the Lord is Good. Uh, that is really one of the key uh, scriptures in, in Psalm 34. And But we're going to kind of see, well, how did David come to that conclusion? Hey Bernice, good evening, how are you? So we're going to see how David came to the conclusion that the Lord is good because he went through some really interesting stuff. As a matter of fact, when the psalm was written, when Psalm 34 was written, it was David's testimonial of when he was fleeing from Saul and um, he came into uh, an enemy's camp, an enemy's territory, and he presented himself to be a madman uh, because he had a reputation now uh, of, of a great warrior um, and Saul's general and hey Tony how you doing bud we're gonna be dealing with Psalm 34 but before we get that we're gonna do a little bit of stuff uh, from first uh, Samuel and second Samuel to kind of connect the dots here so we get a fuller picture of what Psalm 34 is really all about but the message again if there is a title that you wanted for it it would be taste and see that the Lord is good. And so we're going to open in a word of prayer and then we're going to jump in and we'll continue to greet all those that pop on uh, and then we'll go from there. So let's pray guys. Father we thank you tonight that we're uh, we're able to gather. Uh, technology is a wonderful thing God so I, I thank you for the the positive uh, use of technology and the fact that tonight we can connect and uh, and be one, be a family. So I pray a blessing on every heart as we receive from the Word of God, in Jesus' name, amen. Rhoda, my sister, I have been out of town, so I wanted to connect with you, so I'm glad to see you're on. As a matter of fact, I had you on my heart to call tomorrow just to get an update on how you're doing. Uh, I know you're back home now, and you're around the corner from the church, <laughs> so praise God for that. God bless you, Rhoda, my sister. Um, so, anyway... <clears throat> The backstory of Psalm 34. Um, if you read read the first verse, I'll read the first verse to you, and then we're going to jump into the backstory. Okay, so um, verse one of Psalm 34 says, "A Psalm of David, when he pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed." Um, and again, we're looking at this sense of uh, the connection here. Now he starts out in verse one by saying. Uh, with that intro, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. 
this is the beginning of the, the lowest uh, part or the lowest season of David's life. Now, imagine this is after he's anointed king by Samuel. Uh, I'm going to give you kind of a chronologic order here uh, from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, um, just so we can grab onto that and begin to see um, uh, how is it that David comes to this conclusion, um, you know, that he will bless the Lord at all times, his praise shall continually be in his mouth. Um, he, he didn't say it when he was on, on the mountaintop. As a matter of fact, he was in the pit at the time when he said it. Um, but this is what made David so special. And I'm praying that we learn as well and uh, that this will help us knowing that on this side of heaven, we are going to have seasons um, that are going to be rough seasons. Now, how do I know that? Well, if you uh, if you read from the, the Messianic prophecies, especially from Isaiah, uh, it talks about Jesus, that Jesus was a man of sorrows. Um, uh, he was acquainted with our griefs. Um, there was no beauty in him. Um, and uh, you begin to look at that side of Jesus and you begin to see that um, he had an assignment from the Father. He came to complete a mission and it was the redemption of humanity. And uh, hi, Faye, how you doing? Um, and, and with that, it, it had uh, ingrained in the assignment challenges, uh, pain, suffering. Um, which we all go through on this side of heaven. Um, and, uh, you know, I was away. Um, I was at a conference up in Buffalo um, this past week. Uh, we got back late Sunday night. Um, <clears throat> so doing a lot of catch-up. But um, one of the things that was talked about um, was Hebrews 11, which is known as the faith chapter. Uh, let me just read this to you because I thought it was really interesting. So you can get an idea of where we're going and what we're talking about. So I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 11, but I'm going to go to the second half of it, or the the, the last part of it. Um, and when I do, it's going to be an eye-opener. Um, let me just find it in my Bible app. Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, now, in, in the faith chapter... It's amazing how it starts out, right? Verse 1, we know that uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made by the things which are visible. Then it goes on to talk about the men and women of faith um, and the exploits and the amazing things that they accomplished. But I want to drop down now, um, <laughs> and let me just find uh, the portion that I'm looking for. All right, I'm dropping down, dropping down. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, beginning at verse 32. Uh, now remember, if you read everything above that from 1 to 31, you're going to see that there are great exploits and, and um, uh, the miracles of God. But now when we read about others that are included as those that had tremendous faith, it says this in verse 32, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the enemies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Now, here's the transition. These are included with the people of faith. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Now, what does that mean? It means that they were given the invitation to have mercy if they denounced their faith. This is why this part of the faith chapter is so important for us to grab onto. Others were tortured, not accepting their deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. They knew that their faith, their life, their existence in God 
was would would was non-negotiable. They would not compromise. These are men and women of extraordinary faith. These are known as the martyrs of the faith. Again, they, 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 the testimony that's talked about in Revelation 12, uh, it says that uh, Jesus defeated, uh, we defeated Satan, right? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. But it doesn't end there. It goes on to say that, and we love not our life even unto death. These are those that are included as the patriarchs of faith that we can learn from, all right? Still others um, had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. They knew of the promise, but the promise had not arrived yet. But because the faith was so strong that God is the promise keeper, they were able to hold their testimony and keep their faith even under the tremendous torture and executions that they suffered. These are the real heroes of faith. And it's amazing that it talks about that in uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews. Now that's, that's just to kind of give you a little backdrop of when we get to Psalm 34, to see the life of David and how he could say something like he said in verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So let's get a chronological order because Psalm 34 was written as a praise unto God. Um, it was a season of David's life when his life um, uh, was, he was being hunted down like a dog by Saul and Saul's armies. Um, he had no place to rest his head. Um, uh, the, the, all the enemies of Israel were after him as well because he was a general in Saul's army before Saul turned on him. And uh, it, it goes on to say uh, a song that was written about David uh, that Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And so this was the reputation that he had in the land. So if he wasn't welcomed in Saul, by Saul or, or in Israel, he surely was not going to be welcomed in the enemy territories of those who were warring against Israel and Israel was warring against them. But this was the backdrop for his testimony. So what are we saying here? We're saying that David's worship is founded on God's promises and not on his circumstances. Now this is what we have to get to and have to begin to learn and, and kind of begin to galvanize our faith is that our worship of God is founded in his promises, not based on our circumstances. Um, it's easy to say when you're on the mountain. It's easy to preach when things are going well. But David lived it. David lived it. This was his testimony. He was on the run. Saul had just thrown a spear at his head. Um, and he was uh, uh, now finding himself in the enemy's camp and the king uh, of that territory was, was, was going to uh, uh, kill him as well, but he pretended to be a madman. Um, and so let's read a little bit about that. Let me give you the chronological order of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 through 22. Then we're going to jump into this and begin to get a little backdrop on David's life and how, how could he possibly testify the way he did or, or how could his worship reach such heights when he was really in the natural, in the pit of hell. It's amazing. This is what makes worship so pure. No matter where you find yourself in life, can you still praise God? Can you still praise him and give him the worship that he is worthy? The fruit of our lives in our, our lifestyle of worship is a fruit that Jesus is worthy of. And are we able to give that to him even when things aren't going well? or they're going drastically uh, worse and worse. Um, are we able to do what David did? Well, let's learn a little bit about him. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, now you don't have to turn to these chapters. I'm going to give you uh, just a little 
really quick um, uh, kind of title for the chapters. First Samuel chapter 16, David is anointed king, right? Samuel comes to the house of Jesse. Uh, this is when the spirit of God uh, is leaving Saul. And now God tells Samuel, go fill your, your horn with oil and go to Jesse's house because I'm going to choose a new king. And we know that all the, the you know, the, the sons of Jesse were, were stout and strong and buff and big and, and look like warriors. And uh, Samuel was taken back by them. And we know that God says, Samuel, um, do not judge by the appearance because I'm not picking someone by the way they look. I'm looking at the heart. I'm looking for one who has a heart after me. And he's talking about David. And uh, so that is uh, the chapter where David is anointed king. And that's where the fun seems to begin. Isn't it amazing how before you're appointed, now you've got to think about this. There, there, there are many years now uh, while David's on the run before he actually um, gets to reign as king over Israel and unite uh, uh, you know, all of Israel under, under uh, his leadership. Uh, I always say this: you're you're always anointed before you're you're appointed. Uh, when you're anointed, uh, it's like the test now begins. Uh, you are now in character training school by the Holy Spirit, and any cracks in your armor are going to be exposed. How do I know this? Because I live this. <laughs> you will not. I always say this too. Let me just give you this. Don't ever covet someone else's anointing because you don't know what it costs them to receive it, okay? God gives us it um, as an assignment and as a gift, and every person has their own anointing. But don't you dare covet someone else's anointing because you don't know what it costs them to wear the armor that God has given them. How you doing, Carolyn? God bless you. Um, and uh, in David's life, he is anointed king. Um, and at this point, um, he is not appointed king. His life begins to take a downturn from this point. Um, so you're always anointed before you are appointed. Then you are enlisted in character training school. Uh, the discipline of the Holy Spirit, as I said before, if there are cracks in your armor, they're going to be exposed. If there's weaknesses in your foundation, they're going to be exposed. Why? Because God wants you to succeed. God never sets you up for failure. God will always set you up for success. Now, success looks very different. You wouldn't think David was very successful here, but we're going to read and we're going to begin to talk about uh, the fact that uh, the fact that he was tracking with God on his personal assignment made him the most successful in all the land in the time in which he lived. Saul was unsuccessful. Why? Because of rebellion and 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 disobedience okay he he disobeyed the the assignment given to him by the lord and because of that uh he was not willing to repent now god would have restored him if he wanted to be restored but he never acknowledged his sin or repented before the lord and because of that he denied the restoration that god would have given him uh, and david you know his life was not perfect he had a lot of failures, and time and time again, he would repent, humble himself, and go to the Lord, and the Lord would raise him back up and restore him. Uh, so again, um, never covet someone else's anointing, because you don't know what it costs them to wear the assignment that God gave them, or to have the anointing that they have. Um, and and, and I, I shared a little bit before that I know that firsthand, because... Um, when God first spoke to me about ministry, uh, about um, uh, loving people, about about uh, you know turning away from my old life and turning to God, um, uh, there were a lot of things that un were unfolded to me that I I had not uh, been appointed to as of yet. There was a long season of character building, and that's important for all of us. Okay, do not you know Hebrews? It's funny we we read from Hebrews chapter eleven. But Hebrews chapter 12 jumps into that and builds on that and says, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. All right? Because he chastens those that he loves. And if you do reject the chastening of the Lord, you have now 
illegitimized your sonship or your daughtership. Um, uh, and it's, it's amazing that that builds off of faith. Why? Because it tells us that everyone that was spoken about in the previous chapter, in chapter 11, all the people marked in the chapter of faith, uh, the hall of faith, right? All those individuals were able to be chastened, corrected, mentored, fathered by the Lord God Almighty. And if you reject that, um, you will never be able to walk in the assignment that God gave you. As a matter of fact, you will be turning yourself over to Satan because if you illegitimize uh, yourself from from the, 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 the Father heart of God, you, you now do not fall into a... Uh, um, uh, you know, an area that, that is uh, uh, neutral, so to speak. Uh, you're either tracking with God or you're, you're in the hands of the devil. Uh, it's one or the other. There's no, there's no safe zone here in which you can deny God and think that you're free from the torment of the devil. Uh, there is no safe zone. There's no uh, purgatory on earth. Uh, maybe that's a better picture. Um, but let's jump into this. David's anointed king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 17, David defeats Goliath. Okay? Now, at this point, he's taken into Saul's court because Saul is vexed by a disturbing spirit, a, 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 a spirit that is, is kind of harassing him. Why? Because the spirit of God left him. And the only thing that soothes him is the, the instruments and the worship that David provides. So he brings David into his court. Um, David becomes one of his generals. David plays his, his harp, uh, and the distressing spirits leave. Um, and so David is now close uh, with, um, with Saul. Now, in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, David and Jonathan build a, 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 a friendship, um, a very strong friendship. And it's in this chapter uh, that the people of Israel start to recognize David. Everybody now recognizes David and they love David. Why? Not because he's promoting himself, because he's walking in his anointing and he's a general in Saul's army. And they begin to sing songs like this. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. This stirs. Remember, without the Spirit of God, we are subject uh, to uh, our flesh governing our behavior. Without the Spirit of God, Saul's jealousy is enraged and he wants to kill David. In 1 Samuel chapter 19, David escapes from Saul. This is the point where David is in Saul's presence playing his harp because Saul has a distressing spirit. There is a spear next to Saul. Saul's um, flesh rises up and he says, I will pin David to the wall with my spear. And he, he throws it. Um, this is a warrior. This is one who knows um, how to use a spear and how to use it effectively. And David is able to move uh, where it does not hit him. And now he flees. Uh, that transpires in chapter 19. In First Samuel chapter 20, Jonathan now meets with David and begins to talk to him about the plot of Saul, his father, to kill David. And uh, he warns him and, and he, he, he encourages him to leave, uh, leave the city, uh, leave the territory. And, uh, and David does. And so 1 Samuel chapter 21 is where, where Psalm 34 kicks into high gear. Uh, hey, Dolly, how you doing? So glad you're here with us. Uh, so, jumping off of um, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21, where David pretends to be a madman, why? Uh, um, you know, let me just, just read, uh, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to that point. Uh, let me just say it that way. Um, and uh, he, he here is, um, uh, he has messed his hair, he is, he's got spittle on his beard, and he is just incoherent. And uh, now the king um, of the enemy territory, um, uh, it, it, it comes to his attention that David, the general of Saul, is in our midst. Shall we take him? And then the king recognizes that, wait a minute, this is a madman. Why would you bring a madman to me? Get him out of here. Let him go. 
and so David escapes uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> the the enemy's camp by pretending to be a man. Man, that's Psalm 34, which we're going to get to in just a second. But First Samuel chapter 22, David flees to the cave of Adullam. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the cave of Adullam and David's mighty men, and then we're going to jump into Psalm 34. And I know I'm giving you a lot of backdrop here, but it's important. If you don't have this, this backstory, you will not understand how pure and how precious the worship of David's heart is in Psalm 34. Remember, we said this before. David's worship is founded on the promises of God, not on his circumstances. And this bears that out. This is what makes his worship so pure. This is why his heart was 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 just aligned with God. Uh, you know, God said of David, and I said this before, that that God was sees David as a man after God's heart. God said, This is a man after my own heart. And David proved that out time and time and time again. Again, an imperfect being fell into sin several times but still always came to the point of humbling himself, confessing before God and repenting and being restored. Um, he loved God tremendously. And we can see the validity of that by the fact that he's able to offer high praise, high worship at his worst times in his natural life. So what's, what's the deal with the cave of Adullam that talks about David fleeing now the enemy territories? Remember, He's left Israel. He's now fleeing the enemy territories. He finds a cave um, in, in a place. Uh, it's known as the Cave of Adullam. And, and this becomes a stronghold for him or a safe place. Um, it's in between uh, Israel and the enemy's camp. And this is where he flees to. Now, something happens when he's there. Uh, let me just read you two verses in 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2. David, therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Now this is, this is a tremendous thing that his brothers and his father's house, that his family rallied around him at his lowest point. Remember, uh, when you go back up to David's anointing as king in 1 Samuel chapter 16, they didn't even want to recognize him uh, as a family member. And when you look at chapter 17, when David defeated Goliath, his brothers despised him. Uh, they said, why are you here? Um, but at this point, there is a restoration in the family bloodline. Isn't it amazing? Do you know that we're blood? We all share the blood of Jesus Christ. So whatever... <laughs> or whatever offense uh, these things are so minor and unimportant in in our relationship with each other and David's family proves this they bear this out they come rallying to him they find him in this cave of Adullam and they went down there to him to meet him and verse 2 says and everyone now now there are a lot of other people who are outcasts rejected um, uh, who who are are find themselves with with no place of acceptance in Israel, and especially not in the enemy's camp or the enemies of Israel. So it gives a description or or the plight um, of these individuals who rally around David. It says in verse two of First Samuel chapter twenty-two, and everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was dis contented gathered to him so he became captain over them and they were about 400 men with him now I don't know about you but if, if my life is in the toilet and um, I'm on the run um, people are trying to kill me um, everywhere I go I, I have no place in Israel I have no place in the surrounding territories of Israel um, everyone is trying to kill me um, I have lost favor with the king, and the king has now set his army against me. Um, and I went to a cave, and in solitude started to cry out to the Lord, Lord, is there anyone who will stand by me? Is there anyone who will believe in me? Is there anyone, God, that you can send? 
And so here's the answer to that prayer. Everyone who was in distress, their lives were a mess. All hell had broken loose against them. Everyone who was in debt, they had nothing to offer in resources. They were bankrupt <laughs> in resources um, and in position uh, within the communities that they had uh, left, that they had been uh, rejected from, that they had been expelled from. Um, and uh, not only that, it says everyone who was discontented gathered to him, complainers, grumblers, um, criticizers, uh, uh, people with bad attitudes. Um, and it says that he welcomed them. How do I know that? Because the next line at the end of verse 2 of 1 Samuel 22 says, he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. It's easy <laughs> to captain, to, to, uh, to coach, uh, to pray for, or to mentor um, people with good attitudes. But David knew that God had sent them, and David embraced them. And he said, I will captain them. I will champion them. It doesn't matter what condition they have come to me. God has a purpose and a plan. And isn't that just the way that we came to God? Come on, we didn't come to God perfect. We didn't have, we're not perfect now. We're far from it. But when we came to God, uh, what condition were we in? And Jesus said, I will champion you in the condition I find you in if you will just come to me. This is a forerunner expression of God's love. So God receives them. He champions them through David. David pours his life into them. Now, I want to read you something from 2 Samuel here to begin to talk about the effect of David embracing the outcasts of his culture. The effect it had on their, their lives was, was, was not just amazing, it was miraculous. Now let me read you who these men became in 2 Samuel 23, verses 8 through 12. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshab, Bashabeth, the Tachmonite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino, the Esnite, because he had killed 800 men at one time. <laughs> I don't know about you. Now, I might have picked a fight with this guy before he got to the cave of Adullam. But after David's influence, remember David's anointing, uh, a worship warrior. Um, if you want to describe David and you had two words, that's the way I would describe it, a worship warrior. Um, his effect on... on um, on uh, this individual, Josheb Beshebeth, um, was that he was able to champion the causes of God, and at one point he defeated himself, killed 800 men uh, at one point, uh, at one time, in one battle. Uh, and after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defiled the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated. He rose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was so weary and his hand that his hand stuck to his sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to plunder. Could you imagine fighting for hours upon hours with the sword of God in your hand to the point where your hand is, 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 is frozen, it is, it is kind of grafted, as though the sword was, was an extension of your arm, another appendage on your body, being wielded by the Spirit of God. These are the, the, the influences of your anointing that, that you have the ability with your anointing when you are surrendered to God, no matter what your circumstances are. Now remember this. David's circumstances were not good at this point in his life when he championed these individuals. And he championed them to the point where his love for God, remember he went vertical first and then began to operate on, on the horizontal plane. He was heavenly connected 
but had an earthly assignment. You too are heavenly connected, but you have an earthly assignment. Your anointing is to shape the lives of others. It is to share with others. It is to have an overflow that is so incredibly powerful that it encourages others so that they step into their own assignment and achieve what God had declared that they would achieve. In other words, the promises of God come to uh, uh, impact our lives as God mentors us by his own heart, by the heart of God, the Holy Spirit, and by the leaders that he causes to mentor us and to shape us. And remember, in the season of character building is where we are tested the most. And it's in that backdrop that the mighty men of David were perfected. They were honed. They were, they were sharpened. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really an amazing story when you think about it. Uh, it goes on to say this in verse 11. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, uh, the Hararite. Uh, the Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines, but he by himself stationed himself in the middle of the field and defended it and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Now this was the food source for uh, David's camp. And when the Philistines came because they needed food as well, uh, they came upon this field uh, of lentils. Um, uh, this one individual, Shammah defended that field with his life and was victorious. Isn't that amazing? This is just some of the effect that the anointing of David had on those that came to him in a completely... I mean, these would be known as uh, not just outcasts in society. They were probably... Um, tagged as those um, uh, of mental illness, um, handicapped, um, had no capacity or potential, um, and the list goes on and on and on. These were the individuals that came to David, but, but you begin to see that David did not send them away when they came in the condition that was horrific. They didn't come in shining armor with all of the resources of Israel. They came in rags, bankrupt, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And when someone loved them, they began to produce. Their hearts were in atrophy for the lack of love. But David championed them. David was their captain. He, he mentored them. He loved them. And they began to blossom to become all that God intended them to be. These are the mighty men of David. Now let's go into Psalm 34. This was the introduction to that. I hope you're getting something out of this. Tony, look, it's my purple cup. <laughs> Tony may have a running joke about this purple cup. <clears throat> Verse 1 in Psalm 34. A psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Can we say the same when we find our life at the lowest possible point in our natural history? David did. And David went on to say this in verse 2. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. At this point, was there anything for David to boast about? This, this is what David penned after uh, he, he in, in chapter 21 of 1 Samuel, he has to pose off to be a complete lunatic so that he would not be executed by the enemies of Israel. King Abimelech and his army, the Philistines. And upon departing from that area, this is what comes out of his heart. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. 
and the humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Do you want to know why the, the people that came to David were able to blossom? Because this is what he spoke into their lives. He brought them to God. The greatest thing you can do for any individual that comes to you for help, for counsel, for prayer, is to lead them to Jesus. It's not your power. It's not your charisma. It's not your giftings. It's Jesus. And so what did David do? David brought them into this cave and began to pour this over them. And he says this to them. Now think about this. He's in the cave of Adullam. This is what he says to them. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. He's saying this to people in debt, distressed, or bankrupt physically, emotionally, spiritually. And he says this to them in verse 3. Oh, you magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Could you imagine that? They are hiding out in a cave for fear of their lives. And this is what David gives them. This is the food he begins to feed them with. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Talk about encouragement. He's testifying to these individuals that he's champion of and that he's going to captain. And he's beginning to tell them, this is the source of my strength. My worship is my warfare. Come on, we've, su we've sung that song, right? Worship is my warfare. My praise is a weapon. And David begins to give them an armor that they had never, ever begin that you know that they had never not just had they never heard of this they'd never seen it in action remember david couldn't wear saul's armor he wore the testimony of his relationship with god when he filled his shepherd's bag with five smooth stones and took goliath out david begins to empower the brokenness of 400 individuals by sharing his worship with them my God, this is, this is incredible. When people find you broken, when people find you in chaos and everything against you, if you can lift up your praise, if you can worship God in the midst of that, do you know what the people are going to do around you? They're going to know God is real. They're going to see it in your heart and the overflow of your love for God that it's not based on your circumstances. It's based on who God is and God's promises. Verse 5. They looked to him, to God, and were radiant. They started to have the, the not just the anointing, but the presence, the glory, the radiant beauty of God began to fill them and their faces were not ashamed. Now they were accepted in the beloved. It's amazing the deliverance that was happening to 400 individuals who were outcasts of society that David at his lowest point in life began to pour into them this depth of worship. David learned this in the solitude of being a shepherd boy. It's just him and God. And when, you, when you're faithful in the downtime, it's going to serve you well in the time of challenge. It's amazing. Verse 6, The poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Now, I, I want you to really, I, I wish I could somehow uh, create a movie scene of Adullam and David speaking this over the brokenness of 400 individuals as a man who is being hunted like a dog. David sharing this with these individuals and watching 
their countenance shift and change, watching them rally to God and align themselves with David. Now I'm going to go back to one of the earlier verses in the psalm where David invites them in, right? He says in verse 3, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. He invited them in to his relationship with God. I think it's time we do that. It's time we invite others into our <laughs> our reality. You know, not beat them up with scripture, but invite them into the beauty of the Lord. Let's magnify the Lord together. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. That's verse 7. Now, verse 8 is key because David begins to share um, his experience with God. And he this is another invitation verse. Now, when you, when you look at the backdrop, you begin to get understanding. This is not a standalone psalm. This, this psalm has a story associated with it, and it's attached to the cave of Adullam. So here's another invitation of David to the 400 individuals that came to him on that day. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. He begins to not only invite them, but he challenges them. He says, I, I want you to see for yourself. Don't, don't take my word for it. You taste of God today and see how beautiful God is. Then he goes on to say, if you taste and see that the Lord is good, you will be blessed and you'll learn how to trust in God the way I do. That's what David is saying in that verse. Let me read it again. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. Now, again, when we look at this word fear, we, we have lost in, in and sometimes I say this when I'm teaching on the fear of the Lord, that we are very cavalier with God, very nonchalant, and, and I don't think we understand um, the majesty of God because we have lost the fear element. I'm not talking about trembling and, 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 and you know, fear that way. What I'm talking about is, is high reverence and respect. There are two tremendous encounters in the Old Testament. One is with Moses and one is with Joshua. And Joshua was the recipient of Moses' mandate. And both of them, when they encountered God, were told, take off your shoes because where you stand is holy ground. There was a fear, a reverence, a respect. I revere you, God. I recognize that, that your love is, is not something that I, I, I should take for granted. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is an acknowledgement that God really is God, that he is the high and lofty one, that he is God Almighty. And I'm not. And I stand here today by his grace and by his mercy. Well, fear of the Lord, in verse 9, you saints, there is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Now this is, again, he's, as I picture this, um, this is his first message to the most broken in, in, in his society and in the time of his life, including himself. And this is what he's feeding them with. In the natural, even the young lions suffer hunger. But if you seek the Lord with me, together we will lack no good thing. Why? Because God will always work on our behalf for our good. He'll not give us everything we want, but he'll give us everything we need. And that's all we could ask of God. That's part of the reverence factor. That's part of the fear of the Lord. Don't you ever shake your fist at God because he didn't give you what you wanted. You know what? We need to praise God because he didn't give us what we deserve. 
That's why I praise God. Isn't that something? All right, let's read on. I know I'm kind of taking you guys down a, a long road here, but um, he says in verse 11, Come, you children, and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> David is mentoring. David is discipling. Verse 12, Who is the man who desires life and loves many days, that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Now he begins to disciple them for transformation. Remember, he accepted them the way they came to him, but now he's discipling them for transformation. I love you just the way you are, but I love you too much to see you stay in that condition. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil. Stop cursing individuals and let your lips stop lying. Stop speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Remember, this is his discipling section of his pouring in to these individuals that came to him completely uh, broken inside and uh, had nothing to offer. Verse 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. This is the promises that David lived under, right? The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. David is testifying now, perhaps here um, as he's penning this, uh, I mean, he's, he's also telling the story of uh, or reliving the story of when he was a shepherd boy and killed a lion and, and a bear and how he slew Goliath and was and had no fear in him. And he might be recounting the story with these individuals when he when he he, he says to them in verse seventeen, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Now this is the key here. David begins to describe how, what is the protocol to come to the Lord? Remember, David said, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The protocol, if you have a healthy reverence for God, you understand the fear of the Lord is this. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. What is a broken heart? It's not just remorse for sin. I am broken in my heart, God, because I hurt you with my life, my sin, my behavior, my deceit. My heart is broken, God, because you who created me and have loved me even before I was formed in my mother's womb, you and you alone have I sinned against. My heart is broken because I hurt you. And to have a contrite heart means that I come to God, not just confessing, but I ask God not just to forgive me, but to deliver me from the things that that I did to break his heart, to hurt him, that I might be healed, restored, brought back into sonship, brought back into daughtership, brought back into right relationship with God. In verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Guys, we are bound for affliction on this side of heaven. But God is a deliverer, and he promises to do that. The Lord delivers him out of them all. He doesn't prevent us from having afflictions. But if our hearts are broken and we have a contrite spirit and we find ourselves in affliction, 
the Lord will lead us out. And now here's the key to that. We will be able to understand the way of escape because we are so connected with God that we will see the open door that God opens and not the devil. I don't know about you, but there are times when afflictions come and I just want it over and I might try the shortcut or the devil's door. Um, I pray to God I never go that way again. I pray to God that my heart is broken and my spirit is contrite. That when I find myself in afflictions, that I will be able to see only one door, the door of deliverance that God opens and will not touch any other way. I will not go the way of the devil or the way of the world. There's only one way for us from this point forward. That's the way of the Lord. And God only opens up one door at a time. God is not going to open up multiple doors at one time to deliver you out of your afflictions. And we need to pray. You talk about discernment, guys. In the age and culture in which we live, we need discernment now greater than ever. And so I praise God for that. David is teaching. David is mentoring. David is loving. David is pouring out. David is testifying. David, you talk about a sermon and knowing the room. <laughs> Have you ever heard that, that phrase? You know, know the room. Uh, know who you're talking to. Know your audience. These are the 400 individuals who are deadbeats, complainers. They're, they're just the worst of the worst. David embraced them and gave them several invitations to know God the way he does and to see the goodness of the Lord. It says that God guards all our bones and not one of them is broken. Now, verse 20 of Psalm 34, he guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. This is a messianic uh, uh, word here and prophecy of David. Remember, Jesus on the cross, not one of his bones was broken as was prophesied. Um, and so David has interludes in a lot of his writings of of messianic realities um, and uh, and you can pick up those nuances as you begin to read through the Psalms and through uh, uh, the writings about David goes on to say in verse 21 there's only two verses left 21 and 22 and then we're going to pray evil shall slay the wicked <laughs> the own their, their their own methodology will bring about their demise if I'm a son of evil, it'll be evil that slays me. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Will you taste and see tonight that the Lord is good? Will you take the invitations of David? Will you with me? <laughs> I want to go back to verse 3 and read this again. Will you magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together? No matter what circumstance you find yourself in life, don't ever lose your worship. Don't ever lose your praise because he is worthy. He is always worthy of our praise. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Guys, um, I'm just feeling very, very tender um, towards the Lord and towards you. And I feel like we're connecting um, at a deep level. Um, and I want to pray for you. I want to pray that somehow this will be a mark in our natural histories, in, in our lives, our in, in, in the nature of this side of heaven that we now are being translated from viewing God through our circumstances and starting to acknowledge God based on his promises. I know you love God with all your heart and I know you want to magnify him. Can we make a covenant together and, and, and with God 
that we will help each other do that. Remember, David gave the invitations, several invitations in Psalm 34 to individuals who were at their worst point in, in their lives. Will you be able to invite others into your relationship with God when they are at their worst point? I pray that we can do that. I pray that you'll do that for me and I'll do that for you. I love you with all my heart. Let me pray over you. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight that we will learn the fear of the Lord, that we will learn in the backdrop of, of, of natural things, afflictions, um, um, adverse circumstances, and things that come against us, that God is still worthy of our praise. And I pray that we will learn... <laughs> That we can testify even as David did and make a declaration that I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in our mouth. Father, thank you tonight that we're learning what it means to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. To revere you as God Almighty and still have the sonship and the daughtership of your love to be brought close by your loving arms and embraced by your heart. Father, I pray in Jesus' name tonight that everyone that is watching this and will watch this will now be elevated above their circumstances and find themselves seated with you, Lord Jesus Christ, in the heavenly places. God bless you in Jesus' name. Guys, it's been fun. Uh, I look forward to this. And uh, I will see you on Sunday. And uh, God willing, uh, we will have a time and we will learn. Uh, let's, you know what? Let's lead um, through our worship. The experience we have with God. And I want to ask that maybe those who have watched this would come to the altar with me and we could celebrate together that God is a good God. Will you taste and see that the Lord is good tonight? Lord bless you. I'm signing off. Uh, I know I've taken a long time tonight, but I just want to, again, uh, tell you I love you, and God does too. Uh, have a good one. Bye.